Welcome everybody and good afternoon to the Digital Humanities Center's uh, virtual tool refresher workshop series. Uh, I'm Dr. Pam Lack, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Digital Humanities Librarian here at San Diego State University. Before we dive in, I'm going to start as I always do by reading the San Diego State uh, land acknowledgement and I've put the link in chat as well. For millennia, the Kumaye people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many genera generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego State community, we acknowledge this legacy. We promote this balance and harmony. We find inspiration from this land, the land of the Kumaye. If you are not in San Diego, uh, I invite you to share uh, where you're Zooming from in chat. And while you're doing that, I'm going to put a link into chat. This is the link to all of our resources for the virtual tool refresher series this semester. Um, and you'll see there's um, a linked table of contents at the top that takes you through the document. So you'll see that we've looked at over the course of the semester, uh, Timeline JS and StoryMap.js. Last time we were together, we worked on Anoto for network analysis. And this is in our final series of the uh, session of the fall series, we're gonna be looking at Boyant for text analysis. And before I forget, I wanna introduce Fabricio Lacada Ramirez, who is a student assistant here in the Digital Humanities Center. Um, he has been hard at work for many, many months creating fantastic tutorials for how to use Voyant. And so I've invited him here as co-host today um, in the hopes that he can share his expertise with us um, throughout the hour. So Fabrizio, thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you, Pam. And uh, thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of this. And I feel like this is a really great tool for more people to sort of get in touch with or sort of get that refresh on because of the fact that there are so many angles to use it from. Uh, I think it's great that we're given a little refresh on this. Awesome, thank you. I'm also gonna put into chat some links about the DH Center, as well as the, the span of virtual programs that we have been hosting since fall of 2020. Um, we have a few more events this semester lined up. Uh, we're still working on our spring 2022 calendar, um, but if you missed anything, you can go ahead and watch the recordings in our YouTube channel. Um, and let me get the link to that as well. All right, awesome. So today we're gonna look at a really awesome tool called Voyant for text analysis. Um, I really love working with this tool and I love teaching this tool. It's a lot of fun. Parts of it are totally mystifying and I love that, that I, I'm still kind of stumped by it at times. Um, but every time I go into the tool, I learn something new, I discover something new. So it's really, really awesome. Before I go into the tool itself, I just wanted to get a sense um, uh, from folks and you can just sort of sh use an emoji or put it in chat. How many of you have engaged in some sort of computational based text analysis in the past? I see one hand. Awesome. Um, uh, a couple of thumbs up, very cool. Oh, wonderful. So um, depending on how you've done it in the past, um, you might have done it by actually coding, uh, doing the programming to actually do the text analysis. Um, and Voyant for text analysis is really intended for people with no coding skills. Um, and so it's really, it's this lovely graphical user interface and a browser-based tool that allows you to use a computer to help you process what I would call machine ready text. That is text that a machine can, can parse, not, under, not read or understand or interpret, but actually sort of recognize the characters and help you identify patterns um, that enable you to ask and answer specific research questions. So as I always stress with these kinds of workshops, the tool does not replace human reading. It's a tool to help human reading at scale. So whereas if I were just trying to read um, a whole bunch of things and try to do some deep content analysis, I'm limited by my own slow reading pace. I can use a computer to help me um, with that um, to sort of point me in the direction of places where I need to dig in deeper and do that kind of um, close reading that is always um, appropriate for the humanities. 
So, um, and and for those of you who have some experience coding with text analysis, whether you've done it through natural language processing with Python or used R, um, you might, um, you know, when you see Voyant at work, you'll see, you might recognize some of the things you've done in code um, happening sort of behind the scenes. With Voyant, we don't worry as much about what's happening behind the scenes, um, so we don't have to know the coding. Um, and for folks who've never done it before, it's a really good um, entry point. Another thing to keep in mind about Voyant is that it's um, built for humanists. So it's document centric, which means, which is to say that it's built to help you parse many documents or what we would call a collection or a corpus of, um, of text. It's not really a, a tool designed for uh, content analysis for social science research, qualitative research. Um, so it's not really built to help you um, sort of parse um, open-ended responses in a survey or something like that. It's, it's really, it's intended for documents. That being said, I wanna make sure I'm not forgetting any of the links in my resources. Um, you can check out all of the resources that we've been developing at the DH Center at this link here on our Teach DH website. Um, and what I'm gonna do now is dive into Voyant itself. And let me put that link in as well. And I invite you to follow along. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and hopefully you're seeing the Voyant uh, landing page. Is that correct? Awesome, thanks Fabrizio. Okay, so this is Voyant. And um, it starts with a kind of stripped down page where you begin by loading your content excuse me, and there's a couple of different ways you can do this. If you're doing pulling something from the web, you can type in a URL here. If you have your own corpus, you can upload it and I'll really quickly show you what that looks like. This is my dissertation. Um, for today, we're gonna work on one of the preloaded corpus, but this is what it would look like if I was loading my own. This is a small text, uh, relatively speaking, it only has about 350 pages. So you can see it didn't take a long time to load. But I'm gonna go back and load uh, an actual built-in corpus. A uh, couple things to keep in mind. There are many languages that you can use. Um, these are the ones that are currently built in. I'll just scroll a little bit, which means that um, you can either try the auto detect and it will hopefully uh, identify the language of the corpus you're working in, uh, especially if it's one of these, or you can select one. And you'll notice it's not comprehensive, of course, um, uh, but it does allow for Arabic. Uh, I assume sort of standard Arabic, not any of um, particular regional um, dialects or anything like that. Um, and I would expect that the list of languages will Im improve over time. I'm going to use one of the built-in corpuses or corpora, um, corpuses <laughs> that uh, is used sort of to get you oriented to Voyant. I'm gonna use the works of Jane Austen. And when I do that, this is the first thing I'll see and I'm just gonna double check to make sure I'm keeping an eye on chat. Okay, fabulous. Okay, so when I first land, load um, whether it's my own corpus, as is the case here with my dissertation, or one of the built-in ones, which is put in there to help with, with training purposes, you'll see uh, five windows in this general frame, um, what uh, Voyant calls tools or skins. Um, so you'll see, sorry, I've got my little cheat sheet here, the Cirrus word cloud here on the far left. This is the reader that shows the entire text, uh, the entire corpus, and I can sort of jump around and, and read through it there. This is a trends graph, which we'll talk about today. Down here is in the bottom left is the summary. Um, this gives me a quick snapshot of things like the document length. So I can see that Emma is the longest text. Uh, persuasion, I'm sorry, sense and sensibility looks to be the shortest, uh, as well as density vocabulary density. So what has the most complex vocabulary? So which may or may not be the longest text, right? 
And then in the far bottom right, we get the contexts where we see terms in context. And by default, what you're seeing is the most, I think these are the most commonly occurring words across the entire corpus are the defaults showing in our trends. So a couple things to show you sort of at the global scale, and then we'll dive into some of the specifics. The first is some of the ways that you can customize things. Um, first, you can apply what's called stop words. Um, and I'll just type that out in case that's not clear. Stop words are words in, um, in the purposes, for the purposes of natural language processing or information retrieval that are noisy. These are words that don't carry a lot of meaning, though they might be highly um, uh, they might be very frequently used words. Uh, we can think of words like and or or as stop words. They, they rarely carry um, value for the purposes of analysis. And the way that Voyant works is that it's already got some stop words built in sort of the most commonly occurring, at least in this case, in the English language. And if I want to customize them, I can go into my options and change them. I'm actually gonna do that in my dissertation as a better demo. Um, so here I can edit the list of stop words to add words that I know don't carry meaning in this particular corpus. And this is the kind of thing that depending on how familiar you are with a corpus, you may be able to do without doing any other kind of analysis. So for me, I know that there are certain words that occur a lot because I didn't clean up my corpus before uploading it. So words related to my, bibli my archival research and my bibliography. So collection, um, folder, box. These are words that appear regularly in my citations but don't mean anything. University, because I'm citing a lot of university presses. Um, and just sort of glancing at my, um, my um, word cloud, ed for edition. So I can save those and confirm them. And you'll notice that the word cloud changes because I've knocked those words out. And some of these were words that came that were very, very common. But if you just were to look at the word cloud itself, and I can actually make this bigger, and every time I do, it changes, you can, oh, and press is one of those really good words that is, for me, very noisy. And so you can see as I do this, I'm applying more and more words to take out. But as you see this, you can, um, I can increase the number of words and you can maybe just by glancing at my word cloud, get a sense of what my dissertation might've been about. And if anyone wants to take a guess in chat, you can certainly do that. So you can keep um, customizing your stop words to take out the words that don't carry meaning and focus on the words that do. So for instance, I can see the word particularly. I use that a lot in my dissertation. That's not a meaningful word. I could go ahead and remove that if I wanted to. It's noisy, but it's not creating too much of a distraction. So I could just leave that. Um, and likewise, as I proceed through my analysis, I might determine more and more stop words that are not particularly relevant to my uh, analysis. So I could keep customizing that list of stop words. Um, so that's the first thing you can do to customize. Any questions about that? And I'll add that we have a whole tutorial dedicated to stop words and other kinds of uh, configurations you can do for, um, for doing queries in Boyant. Okay, I'm not seeing anything, so we'll move on. Now, another thing that you'll see is the opportunity to search for particular, look for particular words. So here in our trend, uh, trend graph, you'll see that it's showing the most commonly occurring words, Mr., Mrs., said, Miss, think. Let's say I was interested in um, uh, the theme of marriage in Jane Austen's uh, work, collected works. I could start to type that and you'll notice a couple of things happening here. If you look at this drop down, you'll see that there are many different words that relate to marriage. Um, and what we can do is apply a process called stemming, whereby 
we can capture all of them. So if you see, marriage itself has 246 occurrences across the collection. Um, married has 242 and so forth. If I just type marriage in, I'll only see those words. But if I use the stem, I'll see all of them and I can always delete words as I like. So just to compare, you can see that they generally follow the same pattern of frequency, um, but mare with a star captures a lot more than just using the word marriage. And if I don't wanna search for that anymore, I can get rid of them and it resort, resorts, reverts back to the original tech, uh, words. And you'll see in there that it's chunked out by text start in chronological order, starting with love and friendship and going all the way to persuasion, her final book. Um, in the document reader, it just goes, this is just showing me love and friendship. Oops. And I can click along. I think this is still just love and friendship. Pam, actually, I think each one of those different colors is a is a different document. I thought so too, but I'm not seeing. Oh, it's slow to load. That's why. It's not. Uh, all right, I just have to be more patient. This is the thing when you're working with a big corpus, you do have to be patient. <laughs> okay. Um, also, when I often teach this, I show just uh, one text, one document. My corpus has a, uh, my dissertation is, just consists of one document. So you'll see it just has this purple bar across because it's only one document. Um, and here in my term frequency, it's chunked out just by even chunks, not even the chapters, just like it, my dissertation got segmented by the tool. Whereas this, because of the way the corpus was loaded, where each text is its own, probably its own text file in a zip file, um, you can see that Voyant knows it can differentiate between text one and text two. In this case, love and friendship, Lady Susan, sense and sensibility, pride and prejudice, and so forth. And you can see here, you know, you get this visual representation of the size of each corpus, right? So it makes sense if the shortest one is um, Lady Susan, I believe, and that corresponds here with the shortest here. So you're getting this visual representation of the size of each text, right? And we can always drill down and only look at one text if we want to. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, Pam, uh you mentioned drilling down just a second ago, and I thought that might be useful to sort of display for folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I want to do is um, I'm going to move into the trends, and I'm going to make this a little bigger. I want to what I want to do is sort of dive into some of the preloaded visualizations, and then I'll show you how to work some of those, and then I'll show everybody how you can do some other configurations, including changing colors and changing the kinds of visualizations. So there are many more visualizations and um, graphical representations here than you can see right now. And so this way we can actually, we'll, we'll start to work with some of them and then I'll show you some of the others. So the trends, um, um, the trends, Graph, uh, visual tool rather, is one of the most valuable ones because this shows you commonly occurring words, but in a greater context than just your word cloud, which will give you, if you hover over a word, it will give you a, a raw word count. This is, Mr. shows up 3,117 times across the entire corpus, but that doesn't tell us very much. Whereas um, if I look at trends, I can see a little bit better what's happening per document. So I can see, for instance, that Mr. occurs more frequently in Emma than in any other text, second only to uh, Pride and Prejudice, or Pride and Prejudice is second to that. So there's a couple things I can do here. This is showing me what's called relative frequency, which is to say the percentage of the term across the, the corpus. So I can see here that Mr. is 0.7% represents 0.7% of the entire document Emma. 
if I'm not interested, if I want to see total word count, I can change that to the raw number. This is just the word count. And here you can see that Mr. appears 1,153 times in Emma and 785 times in Pride and Prejudice. So you might have noticed that the difference between these two graphs, while these are still the two most occurring, the two texts with the most occurring terms Mr. in them, it's a much greater total number in Emma than in Pride and Prejudice. And there's a couple of reasons why, right? Emma has is the biggest text in the corpus, right? There's way more words in Emma than in Pride and Prejudice, although Pride and Prejudice is one of the more um, the text lengthy text uh, documents. But also it could speak to vocabulary density and things like that. So raw doesn't give us that context that um, relative gives us in these options. So you can see, relatively speaking, Mr. occurs much more frequently in Pride and Prejudice than sheer number count. So depending on your research question, you might want total number versus relative. Relative is a percentage, raw is just the number. And we can do a couple different things here. We can actually change the graph. We can look at an area graph or just columns. Depending on how many words you're looking at, this may or may not get messy. We could just look at the lines, the stacked bar chart, or the line and stacked, which is the default. And again, it will depend on your, what you're searching for. So for instance, if I want to look at friendship, if I want to look at, oops. Let's get rid of all of these other things. Lift. Okay. Marriage. And now, for some reason, the graph disappeared. I'm going to refresh real quick and see. Ah, I lost it. Try that again. So if we want to see love, if we want to see marriage, if we want to see the correlation between love and marriage, we can't in these books, we can look for that. And if we want to add friendship in, we can do that as well. Uh, and there's any number of words we can look at. So depending on how many words we're looking at, it may or may not, a visualization may or may not help us. So for instance, this one, it's very hard to see because friendship barely shows up in Sense and Sensibility compared to marriage, um, right? It's not going to help us to see it, but here we can see it much more clearly. Um, I tend to like the line and stacked bar. And if I want, I can see the labels so I can see what's what. And you'll notice there's a legend up at the top. At any given point, I can click on a word. And you'll notice when I do this that the reader is, is uh, being responsive. It's showing me here where I am in a document and it, and it moves up, it moves to that part of the corpus. So depending on where I've clicked, it's going to change. So I'm at, I'm, and it's here starting at the beginning of the next text. So here's Northanger Abbey. And you can see, I'm pointing like you can see my finger, but and here it's moving along this bar here. And then I can double click, double click. Sorry, there we go. And here I get a couple options, terms and document. So if I just wanna see, and Fabrizio, you're gonna to have to remind me of this section because uh, Fabrizio actually taught me how to do the drill down for trend, the trend graph. So now I'm looking, what am I exactly looking at here? So the two options are sort of like a zoom in to that particular uh, document or term, whichever one uh, that you chose. And so you did the drill down for the, uh, for the term friend a second ago. Um, seems like things might have reverted back to- Oh, I, I refreshed, sorry about that. I'm having That's trouble. Okay. Keep going, please. Right. Um, so if we do a drill down on, say, uh, Mr. right there at the top, and we drill down for the term, it'll take us into sort of um, a streamlined version of the graph, 
where the term is what we is highlighted throughout every single uh, document, that specific term. Um, would you be able to do that with Mr. real quick? It's not letting me drill down right now. I'm huh, having trouble. Okay. Let me refresh one more time. The, um, the um, what do you call it? The uh, hover overs, oh, here we go. I'm having trouble with these. Okay, so I'm on terms, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Here we go, okay. Right, so once we do that, we could see the legend at the top. We have eight different misters, which sort of correlate to the eight different documents that we have. And they have the color correlation there so that you can see it a little bit amongst the chaos. Um, but uh, we have uh, this sort of separated amongst the same document, I think. Did you, I'm sorry, did you click on terms or the, or the document? Terms, yeah. Okay, so here we have, um, along these different document segments that we have. And we can see that sort of the, the purple for document four, which I forget which document that's relating to. Let me double check here. Uh, but each document in the corpus has a number correlated to it, depending on, on, on the position it has in the corpus. So document four is actually... This appears to all be persuasion. Um, Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's sorry. Document four is Emma. My I think that's document six. I'm sorry. Could you could you highlight one of the purple ones? That's what I'm doing. Oh no. It's showing up as the orange one there. Yeah, I'm having. Here we go. It's pride. There and we prejudice. go. Pride and prejudice. So each one of these different um, sort of term lines um, correlate to a different document, and we have these values for that specific document laid out sort of uh, on top of each other. And so um, with document four, which is the purple one, Pride and Prejudice, we can see that sort of at a third, no, no, sorry, not a third, a three tenths of the way uh, through the document, we have a very large spike in the term Mr. there, more than any other documents in, in the corpus. Uh, whereas something like, um, let's see the pink one, that's the third document, that should be Sense and Sensibility, I believe. That one has a very low, um, uh, at sort of three tenths of the way through the document. That one has a very low uh, amount of the term mister. So this is a very good way to sort of compare the documents to one another by sort of laying them on top of each other and seeing, okay, at this point in this uh, narrative, we have you know the focus on this certain term, but here it's like a, a lot higher. It's a really great way to sort of begin your analysis. I don't think this is a, a like a good uh, stop point, but this definitely sort of points you in the right direction and allows you to think of uh, what sort of anal anal what questions you want to ask in your in your analysis of the text. And I'm trying. I'm having a bit of lag time here. It's probably because we're doing this over Zoom. I'm trying to show the other option, but uh, I'm not sure that I can just yet because it's the hover over is not working. Um, so. I'm going to hit pause on that to show a couple other things that we can do. Um, and as Fabricio says, these are all intended as starting points for you, right? So they're not intended to be like, nothing is self-evident here. Nothing is just going to like suddenly reveal itself to you, right? Like you have to dig in and ask questions. Why is it that Mr. Spikes three tenths of the way in Pride and Prejudice? Uh, what's happening three tenths of the way in. And of course you can change your segments if you want, um, if you wanna have, um, and I'll, actually it's easier to show this in uh, this corpus, which only has one, uh, my dissertation doesn't have multiple documents. And so it's an even set of segments, but if I want to change the number of segments, I can and it will just evenly slice across that dissertation. Um, and so the default in Voyant when you're working with multiple um, documents in a corpus is to chunk along each document. But if you need to see more segments within a document, you can certainly do that by changing those segments in the options, um, in the options. And a couple other things that you can do here, um, whenever, it, this won't show up in every option, but whenever you see the option, you can change the palette, which is what sets the colors. There is a default set of colors 
that um, Boyant uses, and it essentially assigns colors based on sort of term frequency, right? So here, Mr. is the most, I presume it's one of the most commonly occurring words. So it's the first word, it's like a dark blue. Similarly, in my case, the colors are slightly different. It's the same color, slightly different combination um, here. Um, and so I can go into the options and change the palette. I can use one of the pre-existing palettes. These are not uh, user-friendly names. This is coming from the uh, D3JS color palette. Like plat um, these are like prefabricated ones. And these are um, sort of shorthand from a, a, a um, probably like a cookbook of colors. But I can change my colors. And you'll notice they change here as well because it applies anywhere where I can customize the color and apply the color, which is not all the visualizations, it will change those colors. Um, and if I don't like that one, I can go back. I can also edit and I can create my own palette. I have to start from an existing palette. Let's say I don't like these colors. I can remove the greens or let's say I wanna remove the reds. And then if I wanna add some, I can. Um, I'm just adding random colors. Obviously I, I would wanna maybe use a, a, a good palette or a palette that is designed for folks who are colorblind or that sort of thing. But you can see lots of different options there. It's not changing the colors of the documents in my reader because this one doesn't affect it. Now, another thing that I can do is change the skin at any given point. So any of these five windows, I, not only can I make one or two bigger and reconfigure my screen, but I can also change my options by clicking this thing that kind of looks like a windows. And you'll see that there's lots of different options here. I've got options for looking at the total corpus. I've got option, document options and visual, visualization options. And um, you'll see that things overlap, right? So um, the corpus tools show bubble lines as well as the, the visualization, um, visualization tools. Here are my bubble lines. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, I can do a steam graph. And again, I've changed the color. The reason that this color is like this instead of these original colors is because I've applied a new palette. You'll notice here, I can't change the palette in the steam graph, but it's affected by the palette changes I've made here already. I can do a textual arc, which is a really weird, I shouldn't say weird. It's a visualization that has an animation that um, I think is somewhat beta. Um, uh, this is running through the entire corpus and showing me connections of words. Um, this might be useful depending on the kind of analysis you're doing. Uh, for my purposes, I'm not so much interested in the progression of, of the, the words in relationship to each other. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what this visualization is doing. You'll notice that some of these are highly experimental, such as the dreamscape. This is um, an attempt to oops, um, show geographic or spatial visualizations for the corpus. Um, I don't know how well it works in, in this corpus, but I can show you in mine. Oops. Um, it's just pulling any word that it identifies as a location. And I know that there's going to be a lot of noise here because I didn't clean my document before I uploaded it. I didn't get rid of the bibliography, which has a lot of places of names of places of publishers and things like that. But you'll also see that I'm writing about, while predominantly I'm writing about the U.S., there are several international um, connections. There's a chapter about an American in Paris. There's a chapter about the King and I, um, all sorts of different things happening. Uh, some stuff about um, the South Pacific. Um, so this is a highly experimental, highly beta um, visualization. And you'll notice that it's sort of rolling along. It's going through my text and identifying all of the place names. 
a lot of these you'll see are Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, because I'm citing um, uh, um, collections that I got in Hollywood. So it's not that, that telling for me, but I can do it if I wanted to. Let's change to some other ones. We can do terms radio. One of the really lovely things about the visualization is that if I hit the, the uh, question mark, it will tell me a little bit about the tool. So for instance, terms radio can be used to examine word occurrence over a corpus spanning a period of time. And if I can click out into the documentation for more information about that particular visualization. Uh, this will help me figure out what visualizations I want to use and what they're, what they're designed to do, because not all visualizations are gonna help me with the kind of analysis I wanna do, right? This isn't very helpful to me if I'm not doing a, a temporal analysis or, um, I mean, in this case, the temporal analysis could be looking at the chronology of her corpus. Maybe that's useful, maybe not. Um, uh, animations may be useful to what you're doing, they might not be. It, it really, again, depends on what it is you're trying to do. Um, let me see if there's any other good ones here. So all sorts of different kinds of visualizations. And again, just a reminder that you can't always change the palette in any given visualization, but if I change the palette in one where I can do that, it, it impacts the other ones as well. If I wanna go back to that palette, it's this new one that I created. I can't rename it, unfortunately but there we've gone back to the other palette. Okay, a couple other things to show in terms of different visualizations. Not all of the tools in Voyant are gonna be visual based and not all of them need to be. Um, so it depends again on what you're trying to do. The context uh, skin is really, really useful for seeing, common, seeing how words occur and what they occur near, the sort of co-location of words with other things. Give me one moment, I need to, um, I wanted to hide my captioning because it's covering up. Let me just make my screen a little smaller here. There we go, perfect, okay. So essentially what I can do is search for particular words and within the documents, oops, the top here. And I can see what's happening before and after. Now I'm used to seeing the search bar at the bottom and I don't know why it dis disappeared. I might have to refresh again. But what I can do is look for things like where in the text something occurs, I can resort. I don't know why it's only showing think. So I can, I can sort on different columns. If I expand, I can see more what's happening um, before a word or after a word. And I have options as well. Hmm. Let me refresh. This is not behaving normally. Here we go. That's better. Okay. Again, I think it's just because I'm showing this on Zoom. If I want to search for the word love, then what I can do is say I want to see more of the context. I can expand my context, and then I can say, let's say I'm only interested in, oops, Pride and Prejudice and Persuasion, which happen to be my two favorite Jane Austens. If I click, I can see what, much more of what's happening um, in the context. So here's the word love, it's highlighted, right? and I can see what's happening in that context. So I can begin to see how um, things might be paired, uh, the context of, of words. Again, I can click and see, oops, see more 
or maybe I want to see less. And I can change my scale uh, to change the corp the change what I'm seeing in the corpus. Any questions about that? Um, is is there a way to kind of search for two terms? Um... <laughs> Mm -hmm. At one go. Yes. So for instance, if you're looking for, um, so it depends on what you're doing. So in this case, I'm looking at marriage and love and I've stemmed them. If I want to see a specific pairing, and I'm going to actually go into my own dissertation to show this, I can do that. So I wrote about musicals and how in Holly, um, I wrote about gender and Hollywood musicals in the post-World War II era. And I was working on folks like Gene Kelly and Judy Garland. So I could do a search for Gene. Hang on, this is also giving me a hard time. Here we go. Okay, I can look for Gene. I don't know why it's giving me zero results when I know that the name shows up many a time. Okay. Or, and I can look for Kelly, right? Um, I don't know why it's trying to auto suggest words or I can do this I can do what's called piping to get an exact pair match uh, I can also combine that with stemming in case I wanted to say Kelly apostrophe s and I can do that as well so if you want to do an exact match it would be word one pipe word two. And you can add those stems if you want as needed to get, and that would be looking for the pair of words. And presumably you could do that with multiple pipes, right? So you could keep doing that. Um, and that would give you that exact map, exact pair match. If you're just looking for individual words, you would just put them into the search bar. Um, and the way that um, Voyant treats it is it's or not so um, when librarians talk about what's called Boolean search, where we do something like looking for words like and, like uh, Jean and Kelly, that's what the pipe does. If we're doing a search, just Jean and Kelly, Jean or Kelly, that would be sort of effectively an or, where show me all the genes, show me all the Kellys. It's only when we add that pipe that we get that exact match. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you so, so much. Sure, thank you. That's a great question. Other questions about search more generally? Okay. Um, I wanna see if there's anything I forgot to cover or Fabrizio, if there's anything you wanted me to cover or you want to cover for us. I'm just uh, going through my notes in a second. So if, <laughs> if I'm quiet, that's, I'm just reviewing real quick. In the meantime, I will show some more of our visualizations. This is links, it's showing me um, how high frequency terms appear near each other terms. So for instance, and this is perhaps not surprising in the work of Jane Austen, Mr. Mrs. and said tend to show up a lot. Um, and then we get a lot of names as well. Mr. Darcy, anyone who's read Pride and Prejudice or seen any of the movies, that shouldn't be surprising, right? Um, I can look at uh, a table view of the terms that appear. So this is terms by count. Um, so this is not dissimilar from the term frequency. It's just another way of visualizing it. So again, it's really going to depend on what it is that you're trying to accomplish with Voyant, the kinds of questions you've got, and the, the way that you're going to use Voyant to focus your research questions and the reading that you do. 
Pam, I wanted to ask, I'm oh, sorry, oh, did I cut you off? No, 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 not at all. I was going to remember, to, I wanted to remember to show how to export stuff when we, before we're done. Oh, okay. Um, I wanted to know, uh, or I wanted to sort of offer, uh, if we wanted to spend more time on context, we could go over sorting and how it works based on the column that we use, mm -hmm. or we could discuss relative and raw frequencies in uh, trends, which do you, do you think one would be more valuable than the other? Or? Yeah, I, I did cover those very, very quickly. Whoops lost all of my context. So let's do a deeper dive into those two, um, two things. So as Fabricio says, um, there's a couple different things that we can do. We can do a lot of different sorting. Um, basically, this is a table or a grid with different columns. The document turns to the left, the term itself turns to the right. And if I want to, at any of these headers, if I click that down arrow, I can turn uh, columns on and off, position if it matters, the position of the keyword within the document. Let's just look for one word, just to clean this up a little bit. Okay, so I've got one search term here, love, but I've stemmed it, so it could be loved, um, I, or I could do love just without the E, which would include maybe more words, okay. And I could sort. So for instance, if I wanna sort by document, I can, I'm sorting here, it's chronological. So love and friendship, 1790, that's uh, the first text. And the last one is I believe persuasion, 1818, right? So now it goes from love and friendship to persuasion. Um, it doesn't make sense for me to search on the term because I only have one word right now. I just am using love stemmed. Although if I expand this out, I can see different variations of the term, right? It's capturing loveliest, loved, um, um, loving, all sorts of things. So if I did want to, I mean, I could actually sort all the lovings and then loves so it, even though I only have one search term because I've stemmed it, I've got different words in that term column. If I wanted to do it by position, so for instance, let's say I only cared about persuasion and pride and prejudice again, I could, or let's say I only wanted to look at pride and prejudice, I could sort by position to see, um, you know, loved, is the last, this is the last time love, st st stemmed word of love shows up in the text. Or if I wanted to see the first time it showed up, it's the 333rd uh, position that is word within the document. So love does not come up with the first 100 or 200 words of, uh, what, am I in Pride and Prejudice? Yeah, Pride and Prejudice. Um, so maybe there's something telling about that uh, uh, given the nature of what Austin's uh, Austin's work is about. Um, let's see if I'm missing anything. Again, if I expand, I can see more of the context. Um, so if I scroll down, if I resort, this is the end of the story. Um, was there anything else that you wanted me to show with context, Fabricio? Um, I think maybe I could just explain sort of the left and right sorting. Those are a little bit more specific. Uh, when you sort, uh, you could set, sort both the left and the right columns as ascending or descending. And what this does is it takes the um, sort of the character right before or right after the occurrence of the term in the document and it sorts it based on uh, an alphabetical order or sort of grammatical order. Mm -hmm. So um, say for example, if we sort left ascending, I think, so right here we have uh, the, the main term and then the character directly to the left of its appearance in each document is going to start with the A's and then you know go through all the A words, go to the B's and vice versa. Same thing happens with right if we sort right ascending or right descending. Yes, right there. We're going to have love and then a- Yeah, one thing to note with right descending sorting is that it's picking up the punctuation first. And that's because of the way that Boyant is processing the text. Um, so for instance, if I use the word Mr., it's actually going to pick up uh, often the period that trunk that's at the end of Mister. 
because of the way it's processed the text. Typically, it treats punctuation as a standalone um, character, often as a standalone text. That's what Python will do in natural language processing. And so um, you just, it's just a good reminder that um, the computer, when it's processing the text, it doesn't understand. It doesn't know, it just, it's looking at certain, it's applying certain formulas, certain patterns, and it's not actually reading the text. So that's why you'll see things like this. Um, if you were hand coding your, if you were hand doing this, you could actually strip out punctuation if you needed to, um, to, so to make it a little bit more meaningful in terms of search results. So that's one thing to keep in mind with the right de descending search or sorting. Uh, another thing that I want to point out before we run out of time is let's say you're doing a very particular analysis um, with particular search terms. So again, let's sort of reconfigure this. Um, let's say let's say this is what I'm doing. Let's say I want to apply my palette, my specific palette, which I've lost because I refreshed the page. That's fine. Let's say this is something. Let's say I'm writing an article or or something, or a paper for class or something. And this is something that I want to include, this particular um, trend graph. There's a couple different things that I can do um, by going to the share or the export icon. I can do an export view whereby I can take what's called an HTML snippet that I could embed in another website. So let's say I'm doing a blog post, I could actually embed the HTML if I wanted to, or just maybe a URL just to that graph, right? So this is a standalone URL that I could actually link out to or embed in another website um, so that you could, you could actually see what I was looking at, but I can still interact with the text. I can still do I can still do a drill down of this particular view of my trend graph. I can also save it as PNG. I found that that can often be a little bit um, uh, grainy. Um, so he here's the thumbnail and I can right click to save that image. And if we take a look at what that looks like, you see it's a little bit grainy, but it's not terrible. Or I could just take a screenshot of it if I wanted to, but I could configure things this way if I wanted to do it in a st as a static screenshot. So that's a really lovely thing. And then here is my um, embed code. If I had, well, that's a lot of embed code. If I had my own website where I wanted to actually um, have the stat, the dynamic interactive graph, um, and this is a little bit of HTML there. So that's how you might export things out. And also you, um, there is a way, where is this option? Ah, if I wanted a bibliographic reference, I could export that out in different style guides. So I'm a historian, so I would use Chicago, uh, the Chicago. So in this case, what this is doing is citing not Jane Austen, it's citing the Boyant tools that were developed by uh, Stefan Sinclair and Jeffrey Rockwell, and the date that I was using it, and the particular query that I was using. So this is how someone else, this is how if someone else were going to check my citations, they could actually do that. And you can see this here, right? So this is the website. And then it's saying query, that's the search I'm doing, marriage plus love on the Austin corpus in the trend view. So it's a really good way to help you generate a citation. Um, and that way you can use it um, as part of a paper or an article or even a book that you're doing, depending on the kind of work you're doing. Okay, I see that we are getting very close to time. I'm going to stop sharing really quickly to see if there are any questions. And before I forget, because I always forget this, um, I'm gonna put in the link to our feedback form uh, in case you have any feedback for us or you wanna suggest future workshops. Um, but any questions about anything with Voyant that I know we didn't, 
you know, we, we did a lot very quickly and we glossed over a lot of things. But I also want to be mindful of everybody's time. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll also just note that in this um, document that I've shared at the beginning, and I'll put the link back in chat one more time. Oops. Um, if you go down to the bottom, you'll see that there are other tool, other um, alternative tools for text analysis. Um, and I've linked out to my DH lib guide that has a lot of different stuff about, um, about text analysis. Um, for those of you who want to do more advanced text analysis and want to code it yourself, there's options for that. There's also some um, natural language processing and text analysis cookbooks and things like that that you can use. Um, there are a lot of good resources out there, such as the Programming Historian, that not only teach you how to do it, but might provide some of the kinds of code you need that you just need to adapt to your own research rather than having you figure it out all by yourself. So if Oyant doesn't quite cut it for you, you can look at some of these other tools. The other thing I'll add about this document is that um, I've listed a few places where you can look for um, corpus, corpora. So, you know, as I said at the beginning, with Voyant, you know, you need to have some machine ready text that the, that Voyant can actually parse um, and prepare for you. It, it's not actually doing the reading, but it needs to be able to recognize the characters. Um, and not all digitized material is, is usable. Some of it is not in the public domain. Some of it is in the public domain, but is not machine readable, what we would call optical character recognition. So there are um, different libraries and organizations that have been working to create collections that are usable as what we would call as data. Um, and there's a whole movement called Collections as Data, where libraries are trying to make their, particularly their archival material, machine readable. And so I've listed a few examples there. And depending on where you are, if your library subscribes to the Gale Digital Scholar Lab, you can even use their built-in tools, which are similar but different to the Voyant tools, and you can build your own corpus there. So there's, there are different options out there. Um, Hathi Trust is a great one as well, uh, depending on what resources you have available, um, what kind of text you have. And, and just if you're processing and creating your own corpus for analysis, it may involve a lot of cleanup work, right? Like I mentioned when I showed my dissertation that I didn't clean it up. I should have cleaned up, I should have gotten rid of the bibliography and the footnotes and the headers and the footers and the page numbers. And then I wouldn't have as much noise, but I just sort of converted it to a plain text file and slapped it in there. Um, but text and out preparing a corpus for text analysis is very laborious. And um, it's part of the intellectual labor that goes into doing computational text analysis. So it's something to definitely think about as you're going to engage in it. So I see that we're at time. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, but I'll keep the Zoom open a little bit longer if anyone has any lingering questions. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, really was a pleasure to dive into Voyant. Big thank you to Fabricio for all your help. Um, Fabricio is far more of an expert in this tool than I am because he's just immersed himself in it for months and months now. But thank you all. and. Hope to see you at future or pa uh, future digital humanities vir virtual programs, or you can always check out our past ones on our website. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Thank you.